So thank you, Mark. So actually, I. So first of all, thank you, the organizers, for the for organizing this, this uh, very nice school and um, inviting me. So um, when I was asked to provide a title, uh, I was not sure if it's, it's, it's if it was a, a more a school or more a conference where I should present more recent result. So I just give a very general. So this is uh, almost everything you can imagine in Turin. So I obviously, is what this is very ambitious. So I will not talk about all what is in the title, and about I will mainly talk about Kelvin Weiss and Volta Reconnection and Kolmogorov, we have here a lot and uh, we will hear more about it. So this is a we don't, uh, we're going to jump. So what I'm talking today has been done mainly in collaboration with uh, David Promon and, Al and Alberto Viloas, Bilo who is now in, uh, in Torino, and uh, two former uh, PhD students, Umberto and uh, Nico, who is uh, now about to go to Paris. So. Basically, so this, like I think, of now we have seen many, many, many times the face, um, sorry, the, um, the face diagram of helium, where we have normal superfluid uh, temperature, okay, the two fluid description. So today I want to mainly talk about uh, this region. So this, there will be no normal fluid. So it's really the low temperature limit of quantum turbulence, okay, and uh, it's just dissipation, so a priori there is no dissipation in the system, okay? And uh, as you can imagine, if you want to talk about this, then the main model I will use is uh, gross pitaya scheme. So, if, um, so in the low temperature limit, we can still have a huge scale separation, okay? There is no, no problem. So if we think about um, perhaps the largest experimental facility, Shrek or the experimental show away, they are of order of a meter, centimeter, on the other hand, we have the Armstrong, the typical vortex size. And now there is a very important scale in the middle, which is the inter-vortex distance. So, so we have seen that uh, the uh, gross pita yes, or we have this fluid-like uh, behavior. And uh, we know whatever it happens on small scale, okay, that's, that will do something. Will energy will, if we inject a, a large scale, whatever going here will transfer energy to small scales. If we forget about the mechanism, we, we would really expect to have at the large scale kind of coarse grain vision of what are this quantum vortex is doing. So if you see at this gross pita yes snapshot of a kind of turbulent, if you forget about the filament, you kind of see some very large scale structure that will be maybe clearing in a, in a movie later. Okay? So then you can bring this idea of turbulence, of cascade, where you have eddies, big eddies that will uh, excite small eddies and then transfer energy with a constant flux. Okay? Obviously, this, this is now is a fact, we know it very well, that we have turbulence uh, Kolmogorov at those scales. However, at smaller scales, there is a new physics arising, and in particular low temperature, it's there are only two possible mechanisms, but we can imagine to transfer energy from here to the smaller scale. One is the, the known Kelvin wave cascade, so we have talked already about Kelvin waves, so it's you have a vortex filament, and you excite it, there are waves that propagate. Okay? So physics is nonlinear, okay? and we have a nonlinear system of waves. They can transfer energy through a wave turbulence cascade. And this is one of the mechanisms that is has been proposed to transfer energy from here to here. Another way, it's, it's, it's more difficult to quantify how energy is transferred, is through vortex reconnection. Okay? So just to illustrate a bit, illustrate really what is uh, quantum turbulence, I will just show a movie. Okay, here it's a 3D simulation of the gross Pitayeski. In particular, it's a non-local version with high order nonlinearity, but this is just a detail. It's not very important for that. Okay, what so these orange lines correspond to quantum vortices, and this greenish uh, cloud will be sound waves that are emitted and during the evolution. So this is um, so what you, what you observe. You start playing with the movie, so you you see a lot of vortex reconnection, Kelvin wise. So that we are zooming inside the box. And then if we zoom outside the box, what you observe is really like a fluid-like fluid -like, uh, movement, okay, large scale. So, um, so this really shows you that it's um, really, really a multi-scale problem, and we need to try to see how we address it. So if we want to summarize a bit what are the main properties of uh, quantum turbulence at low temperature, it's, it's a superfluid, so there is no viscosity, so dissipation of energy a priori should be done in another way, okay? It's compressible. Okay, so it's uh, if, if you think this is a GP, there are waves that propagate, sound waves and dispersive waves. It's described at a wave function. Okay, and the most important, we have quantum vortices. Okay, that is in any turbulent state, uh, they will be there and will they play a very important role. Okay, so 
what is the best way of uh, thinking about a quantum vortex is you take a tornado in classical fluid, and if you look at the circulation, this is a real number. So circulation in Romanian is just the integral along uh, in a closed loop. So the way one maybe one should think about a quantum vortex is you are uh, you're coming from fluid dynamics is to say, okay, you take the core of size of this vortex and you take it to zero, keeping circulation constant. Okay? So from the fluid point of view, that gives you velocity that uh, goes like that around the vortex with a velo with a that decreases like a one over r. We know this is more important than that. Circulation is quantized, okay? And actually these are topological defects. And as we said, it's typically an Armstrong in helium, and um, depending on the setting in a BEC, it could be of order of micrometers. So, so there is a special uh, um, time de devoted to what, how to model uh, superfluids. So Carlo will uh, will lead the discussion. But in general, we have two axes. Okay, if we want to try to describe a superfluid helium, for instance, one is the scales. Okay, and the other one is temperature. Obviously, if we are at temperatures above the T lambda, this is the answer is simple, we should use just navier stokes But the reality is, if we want to describe the physics, there is no one universal model to, to describe all of the physics. So, um, so, for instance, if we are at a very large scale and temperature not too low, we can forget about quantum vortices and study some coarse grain HVK mod uh, the dynamics. If we want to really model low temperature, um, physics and at a scale that are close to the healing lens will really look at the vortex dynamics, so far the, the most pure, the same model, will be the gross pita -Yasky. Okay? So as I mentioned before, today I will be just be using one model, which is the gross pita -Yasky. Okay? So I will review it a bit, so we have seen it a couple of times, so I think I think can go quite quickly. So it's the nonlinear Schrodinger equation for the wave function Psi, okay? Uh, the first thing that comes to mind, this is a non-linear wave equation that admits two types of wave. The one which is relevant for us is, uh, uh, let's say, sound waves, phonons, that are given when you linearize this equation around a fla flat state. So you have a flat a condensate state and you put waves on top of it. So this is flat uh, plus a small um, perturbation. You linearize the first order, diagonalize the problem, and you get what is known as the volume of dispersion relation, which depends on the amplitude of the condensate. This is uh, something very well known, but here it's kind of better to write it in terms of two physical uh, land scale. So if you factorize everything out, okay, you get that the, the relation dispersion will go like CK. C is the speed of sound that can be re-expressed in terms of physical parameters, times the square root of one plus uh, this correction. Okay? So from here, you realize if uh, we are looking at large scales, okay, it means scales much larger than uh, than psi this is negligible and this just this is just sound okay like sound waves in an any standard fluid however if you're looking at small scale this person takes in and this is a uh, play a really a crucial role in the dynamics so so this is a wave equation where is the uh, hydrodynamics here as we, as we have seen we take the Madelung transform so this is a complex field we write in terms of the density and the phase we plug it and we get the continue to equ equation for the density that is density is transported by the gradient of the phase and the phase satisfies the Bernoulli equation plus some um, dispersive tan okay so still here there are no vortices phi is potential so we have vortices as quantum um, as topological defect okay which is basically um a zero of the density where there is the phase has a discontinuity. So this jump produces a, a finite circulation that is quantized. But what's perhaps most more um, important is to say okay if I have a velocity field that go like one over R, that means that the curl of the velocity is a Dirac. Okay? So and I, if you this is in um, 2D, if you are in 3D, if you're it's basically will be a line integral over all the vortex filaments. Okay, so it's a very singular distribution. But as, um, as, as we, we discussed this morning, density is such that because of uh, dispersion that regularizes everything, density, density has to vanish where the, vo the velocity diverges and everything remains regular. Okay? So if you're coming from the fluid dynamics, you say, okay, I, I, I actually, you don't need to care about from what I'm really simulating. What I'm doing is it's kind of Euler's simulation, okay? Where I'm done all the vorticity is concentrated on really thin filaments, and I have one small-scale dispersion, dis uh, so I have, I have a small-scale dispersion which regularizes everything. 
So this is uh, this person is important because really allows the system to reconnect and do uh, the fluid-like behavior that we we are used to. Okay. So I just need to spend. Uh, I will use it just a bit. Uh, the bios of art. I have also want to summarize. So I said. So for a collection of line, okay, vorticity is the line integral of over all these filaments. So if you remember electromagnetism, this will be just the current. If we know the current, we can get the magnetic field. So this is exactly the same. This is the bios Savart integral. Okay, if we know the distribution, so velocity is uh, the, 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 the green function of the vorticity of the curl operator. This is just the bios Savart. So we if we know the vorticity distribution, given like this, we know the velocity at each point. And roughly speaking, the vortex filament method say that the velocity that, that of one point of this filament is just the global environment, envir environmental velocity produced by all the other filaments at that point. Obviously, this will diverge where the vortex position is, so we need to regularize it in some way. And furthermore, this is a solution of the Euler equation, so vortices cannot reconnect by themselves. So when they get close, when they are close we need to provide some rule to con cut and connect the line. So this was the original idea of uh, Schwartz. Okay? And since then, it has been a, a model uh, that has been used a lot to describe quantum turbulence. So as, uh, as I mentioned, my, my talk is really concentrated in this part. Okay? And I, it's two topics, so Kelvin wave cascade okay? and vortex reconnection. If you are interested more in the classical uh, part of the of quantum turbulence, I, I, I advertise these uh, two talks next week by, by Juan and, uh, and Nico, who will really show that there is just not an spectra, an spect energy spectrum that we can show that is the same. Is even actually some of the intermittent fluctuations that are uh, equivalent in the in the turbulence. So let's let's go to Kelvin waves, okay? And I am so Kelvin waves is ob obviously something that was just discovered by Kelvin. Lord uh, William Thompson, okay, and uh, this is, is how the, his paper starts. It's a, uh, it's really nice how it is. It's, a, it's, a, it's an amazing paper to read. Uh, just modulo the the, the 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 equations and the notation of the 19th century, but it's, it starts saying, okay, what is a uh, Kelvin wave? This is the case of fluid motion when the street lines are approximately circles with the centers in one line. Blah blah blah. It is just written in a in a, in a spirit that I I. I, I I, I wish I could write uh, today. But what he actually did is something very simple. So obviously at that time there was no notion of superfluid, okay? And uh, Euler, Euler equations were the basics of fluid dynamics. But he said, okay, but let's take a vortex. So this is the uh, streamline that are approximate circles. So you have a cylindrical perfect vortex straight, okay? So we know what is this. So it's uh, the velocity is just uh, going around that vortex. Okay, the goes like basically forget about this R dependence, go like one over R, R on theta. Okay, and this is just a solution. If you plug it in the Euler equation, you can, in the Euler equation, cylindrical coordinates, incompressible, you find out that the pressure, okay, is just given by an integral of uh, this a fun alpha function. Okay, so this is an exact solution of the Euler equation in, a, in cylindrical coordinates. And uh, if you take this, okay, and you compute the circulation of uh, such a vortex, you get that uh, the circulation is 2 pi times alpha. So if you are thinking about a quantum vortex, alpha will be just a constant, okay? Or just a constant, or a something up to a core distance, and then constant. And uh, what are waves? Typically, in any nonlinear problem, we take our um, steady solution, and we perturb it with a small uh, uh, perturbation delta v, and we go to the first order, okay? And that's what he did, it's a kind of long calculation, but in the end, he expressed this is a bit of um, a bit misleading, but basically they have a wave vector k that does represent the oscillation of the, of the vortex filament in that direction, and related to theta, so it says how fast it turns in that way, the filament, and omega is the frequency. And in any nonlinear problem, when we look at waves, we plug this, we have a solubility condition, and get which relate k, n, and omega, and this is what Kelvin found in the case of a hollow vortex core, which is the simplest of the expression that he found in his paper. Okay, so you, you see that the depending on the n, you have different types of, of, of dispersion relation. Okay, uh, what you observe here is gamma over a square, a is the core, okay, so this is kind of a very high frequency, so it's, this corresponds to the frequency of a fluid particle going around the vortex close to the core. So this is a kind of very high number. 
okay? And what I'm plotting here is our different dispersion relations of the Kelvin wave, okay? So for instance, if I look at um, uh, this is zero here, if I look at n equal to two, okay, the values are go to quite very high, okay? n equal to zero has a very peculiar way, but n equal to one, it is actually quite nice because it starts at zero, okay? If you look at a large scale, so this is this point here, has frequency that are zero for one of the branches. And this is the branch that we actually always, when we say Kelvin waves and superfluid, correspond to n equal to one and only the one touching zero. Because the other one turns too, too rapidly and we expect about some mechanism, whatever it can be, they will be dissipated and kind of irrelevant. So what is, th there are Bessel functions involved, but if you take the limit n equal, to, so take n equal to one and the limit of small, large scale, so that means k is small, you get a very simple formula where you have waves that propagate like k square with a logarithmic correction, okay, and a constant b that in the case of a hollow vortex has a very specific value. But if you change the model of the core, you will always get something like this with a different b. And this is, okay, this is the actual Kelvin wave and this is the asymptotic approximation. And when we look at Kelvin waves, we are actually interested in the really those type of waves. So this is for a Euler equation, okay? And uh, for a superfluid, we had to wait for, uh, well, first for Pitayeski to study what is a vortex in the gross Pitayeski equation. In the same paper, he actually found this dispersion relation for a wave, okay? So it's, uh, so it's already almost, almost completely, okay? But the actual and proper uh, calculation were done by uh, Roberts well, uh, well later in 2003 where he really found numerically, so you take the gross pit ISK equation, put a straight vortex, cylindrical coordinate, perturb it, do a nonlinear problem, linearize, find the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of that problem, and give you um, this formula where you have to do a bit of numeric in the end. And we relate that the core constant is, is 1.2 healing length. Okay? So this is an exact result from NLS equation. This is for uh, the, in the hydrodynamic limit. So this is very large scale, a scale much larger than the healing length. He also did something is, is was much, much simpler in his paper. It's the opposite limit, okay, where you have a very small scale, a scale smaller than the healing length. And he found that the, 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 the vortex excitation, that it's difficult to talk about Kelvin waves of uh, something that is smaller than the core size, but just follow k square, like uh, three particles. So th those are numerical simulations we did a couple of years ago. So it's it's, well, I will not give my many details, but it's on almost a straight vortex in gross Pitayeski. We track the line very accurately. So in the end, we get the position of the line as a function of the height, okay? And that we do it very frequently in time. So and then we make a Fourier transform in space and time. And this is a spatial temporal spectrum, okay? So this white cloud that is uh, below the green line is actual data, which is much better, it's clear here in the zoom. And when we're comparing here the different predictions, if you just take k square, it's very far from the reality. If you take the logarithmic correction, you really see it. So it's really present in the NLS equation. So you think about waves, uh, Kelvin waves there, uh, the log is important, okay? Um, so that just to say that these are present. But what is important in also is that they are dispersive and k square, okay? And there is a much simpler model, okay? Which is called the local induced approximation. It's, it is known to, to, to provide wrong results in many aspects of turbulence, but the other hand, it's very easy to, to handle and do analytical calculations. So I love you to learn, understand uh, many things. So it's, it's, as far as I understand, that was introduced by the Rios in, uh, in, in 1906, okay? And the idea is very simple. So it's an undergraduate exercise to, to, to find the velocity of a vortex ring of radius r with some core. But this you find it in any textbook from Lamb or, or, or whatever. And we know that for a vortex ring of size of radius r, the velocity of the ring goes like uh, the circulation over r with the logarithmic correction and constant d that depends on the model of the core we choose. What Leah says is basically now take a vortex, a vortex line and at this point, I will draw a vortex, uh, a ring, okay? And I will say, okay, this point here will move as if I had a vortex ring, okay? So basically, we say the velocity of this point will be one over r, the binormal vector. So binormal vector just show that the vortex will enter in towards the screen, okay? And that's basically Bia, uh, the Lia model. And if you replace the binormal, it will be just S prime cross S prime. And this is the simplest approximation of, um, of a vortex. 
So if you want to study Kelvin waves, okay, you can do an approximation, say, okay, if the small, the, the, the um, perturbation is small, I can parameterize a, parameterize a Kelvin wave as a function of z, okay? So I get x and y as a function of z. I, I write s as a complex uh, uh, variable, and I put plug it there and linearize, and what I get is just the linear Schrodinger equation, 1D, okay, for this. So for there, from here, you know that the dispersion relation will be minus omega k squared. Uh, what is nice that this Lie equation also also comes from a vari variational problem. Okay, there is a Hamiltonian, which is related to the total vortex length. But this is so. Th remember that the, the, the goal of the Kelvin waves is transfer energy from the intervortex distance to the smallest scale of the system, and this is certainly too trivial and too simple to transfer energy. Even if this is non-linear in some sense, this model we can show that is completely integrable. So there is no way that this model will transfer energy. So we need to go a bit, uh, make things a bit more complex. Okay, w this is a very simple approximation, actually, of the whole Biot-Savart equation that I show. Okay, so something was shown by Sonin and Vitsunov a long time ago. If you take the Biot-Savart model and now you plug in there this approximation, so you you parameterize your vortex in the Cartesian coordinates, you can show that the Vios of Art equation reduces to this Hamiltonian equation. Okay, that's so the S dot at this point given by uh, Hamiltonian that is uh, obviously not local as Vios of Art, but has a much simpler form. Okay, and from here you can do some perturbation analysis and so you say, okay, our first order, okay, I get a quadratic Hamiltonian, so this is linear dynamic, we give you a dispersion relation that I just show. And then you get a correction that is uh, quartic and sixth order in the amplitude of the of the Kelvin waves. So now you are in a kind of very nice setting. Okay, so you have a, you have a nonlinear problem. Okay, nonlinear. Uh, so you have a 1D system that is dispersive. Okay, you have waves that nonlinear, and that's really the setting of the uh, the, the wave turbulence uh, theory. So what is the wave turbulence theory? It's the analogous of the idea of the Richardson cascade of eddies, but for waves. So you have a wave with a given length scale. Thanks to nonlinearity, this wave, wave, this wave will produce excite, uh, other waves of a length, length scale that is a wavelength that is smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. And this in a cascade process with a constant flux. Okay? And what is nice of this theory, so in the end, the theory of wave turbulence, when it, when it works, it can tell you exactly how is the energy spectrum. Okay, so this is you can do analytical calculation when everything works fine, and you find that if you put a flux epsilon at, at, at the input, the energy spectrum will escape to some power, and uh, and also some power with 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 the, with the scale, and you can compute analytically these two, and even you can compute the proportionality factor. So the idea of applying wave turbulence to 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 Kelvin waves was actually um, due to to cause it at Vitsunov, so Carlo mentioned it, and he said what they, they, could, they took actually this expansion of the Hamiltonian, he said, it's actually I will not show it because it's terrible, and uh, the point is this is what is called non-resonant, so you can remove it with a Hamiltonian, uh, with a canonical transformation, and you just get the actual nonlinearity is, is order six in the Hamiltonian, it means that you have six waves that interact with each other, so it's uh, really, really ugly from the point of view of calculation, but the theory is the same, you just do the theory and you will get some solution. It was too complex that they didn't bother to, to check if it was realizable or not. And it turned out that uh, Sergei Nazarenko and Victor Evov decided uh, actually there are some issues in the theory, okay, which make it not uh, realizable. And they have to kind of heal the theory and uh, become with an effective theory that reduces the interaction to a full order. And they found a new prediction. So that actually was a huge and a very agitated the controversy in the in the 2000s. So they they didn't like the fact that they starting from the same equation, applying the same theory, they obtained very different results. So you see, they predict a exponent to seven fifths. Uh, the, the, the re refined theory is five thirds. Just a coincidence with the Kolmogorov. It's nothing related to. Okay, but. There is an important difference. This is scaled to the like the flux to the power one fifth, and this one to like the flux to the power one third. So these are actually important things. The good thing here for this theory, we also have the proportionality constant. Okay, and uh, it's worth remarking that uh, also Vining had a, an, an, another prediction that is very strong. They say that they say that basically 
Nonlinearity should be very strong for Kelvin waves, so all the theory is uh, it's useless, and uh, the real spectrum should, should be chi to the minus one, which is uh, called a critical balance. So uh, what we obviously want to do is, is, okay, there is no way of convincing two, gra two groups of Russians fighting to each other and say, you are right. <laughs> so what at least we can do is try to do some numerics, okay? And, uh, but numerics are not so simple, so if you want to really stay into the framework, this view of art, okay? It's kind of difficult. Either you do the uh, Sony's vision of Hamiltonian, so you need to deal with this kind of uh, non-local, which is non-trivial, or view of art, which also not so simple. Andrew with Jason did some very nice uh, calculation and uh, shows, um, I will not, uh, results that are compatible with uh, some of the two theories, I will say in a second. But what I, I, I did some, some years ago is say, okay, I, I would like to do gross Pitayevsky because it's nice because I don't have issues of a small scale uh, regularization of your art. I, everything is very smooth and I can put it just in a big computer. I know how to parallelize, I can do things. However, I don't know where the vortex are. I need to find them if I want to look at the, the excitation. So over the years, we, de we developed different ways of tracking those vortices, okay? So the, the first uh, attempt was very, if I knew the geometry of a one, of one line, I can use the fact that there was, uh, I'm in a periodic box using set of spectral codes to really track very accurately what is vortex and uh, from the field get some signal, some uh, vortex as a function of z, and once I get the coordinates, I can do whatever analysis I want, okay? Uh, but uh, and, uh, later on, with um, the, the colleagues from New from um, uh, from Norwich, we we generalize this, and actually, it's uh, it's an algorithm that uh, basically you give the f the wave function whatever it is inside. This outputs a collection of lines, just a list of of data that we can track and analyze. And this has been very useful for different problems. So. So this was the, so the theory of, uh, of Kelvin waves is a weak turbulence, so it's really derived for an almost a straight vortex, okay? But in reality, turbulence looks more like that. So if we expect that this to work, it will be a very small scale, okay? Something like, like this, and the question is, it has any sense, could be observed. But so what we did is we took a turbulence simulation, so, it, uh, so we have a hero tangle, so this is an outcome of this. Uh, each color represents a different vortex. And so we know individually all the vortex in the system, and we can take the largest one we found in the box, okay? So for instance, this one, uh, it's you see that it's very, uh, um, um, there are many oscillations at the many scales, okay? And then we analyze the largest ring in the box, okay? So the typical temporal evolution of, uh, of this initial condition, is, it looks like this. So initially we had a large scale flow, okay? So vortices are very well ordered for those who, uh, well familiar with uh, the Taylor Green uh, vortex, you will recognize a bit the structure of this, okay? And uh, what happened with the, with time, basically, so this all this line will reconnect, will create a vortex tangle, and eventually, a very long time, only will some few rings remain, okay? And what we do, so we took the vortices all for different times, from t equal to zero, and look at the energy, sp at the um, at, at the amplitude spectrum, okay, which is, uh, is will be shown here in this movie. And this line here is just to, to show one of the predictions, okay? And what you said during um, a time around 10, what it was before, there was a really nice uh, data lying on top of this straight line. And eventually, well, yeah, there are not too many vortices, they are shrinking, so basically the large scale of the spectrum is moving to the right. So if I summarize the, the data, basically this is, uh, the, the, this is a, um, a, s a summary of the, of the movie at different times. You really see here an nice scaling. And um, this we did it for many times, okay? But then we repeat the simulation just for one time, a largest box. And this is the type of factor we got. So in, in the end, what we observe is really the scaling uh, pr uh, predicted by um, Elbov and Nazarenko, okay, which is 11 th third for the amplitude or 5 thirds for the energy. So and this is the compensated spectrum where we compare the two predictions, okay? So if you want a bit the takeaway message of, of, of this part to say, okay, if I have, a, I have a turbulent flow, okay, if I look at individual uh, components, it's each of these vortices, each of those will contribute in, in order to create, it will contribute to creating um, a cascade, okay, wave turbulence cascade that is predicted by the theory with its exponent. But if we look at all the system collectively, what we get is called Mogor of turbulence. So it's a kind of really, really multi-scale and, and uh, system. 
But the idea of looking at uh, the Kelvin scale was basically uh, the idea of a half Kolmogorov scale, Kolmogorov turbulence at large scales, a half Kelvin wave at small scale. Will it be possible to, to observe it in simulation? And it actually, we did it. But it's we just took a non-local and uh, high-order nonlinearity of GP. This because we are trying to match a bit with uh, with helium, and uh, it turned out to be very good for s for observing the Kelvin cascade. Okay, so what I'm plotting here is uh, the compressible part of the kinetic energy. Okay, and this is the intervortex distance, basically, and uh, what you observe is really Kolmogorov of uh, scaling at the large scales and another. Very now very clear. This almost one decade of uh, k to the minus five L. Okay. Uh, here. Okay. So the the theory, the idea is uh, there is a all a theory also by by Victor and Sergey, which we should have a bottleneck here that is joining those. The argument is kind of simple to 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 say. Here we put energy here, epsilon. This go energy here should be like epsilon like to the two third, and for the cascade it should be epsilon to the one third. So you need to match those fluxes, so, so, and uh, the only way of doing it is connecting it, and they say, okay, in between should thermalize. But as a matter of fact, you can also see that the jump from this two is proportional to the logarithm of the ratio between the intervortex distance and the healing length, okay? And this is very difficult to, to actually to, to get it large, okay? So that's why we'll never observe a bump in principle, okay? But should be there, but uh, you will need, we'll need way more range in this uh, area, and this is a bit difficult to obtain. Hmm? Uh, yeah, this is the next slide. So, <laughs> oof, it's too small to check, and uh, probably they will not because they are still very influenced by this, and um, well, here this will not harm much. So, this is an actually a, a good point, uh, Andrew. So, as I say, this is the prediction Kolmogor of turbulence. CK is the Kolmogor of constant, what is expected to be of order one. Okay, uh, you have option to the third, and uh, for the Kelvin waves, rem I remind you that it was calculation for a one single vortex line. A priori, you cannot just apply to a 3D fully a 3D for a box, but basically you can kind of get an a phenomenological argument. Say, okay, so if I'm the vortex distance, I can, I will have many little Kelvin wave cascade in my box. Okay as many as the big box divided over their intervortex system to the cube, and each of those will contribute in an additional manner. And then you kind of uh, phenomenally add up all this uh, well wave cascade, and you get an intervortex distance in, in between. And uh, what we did is a bunch of simulations, bearing um, all what we could change, all ratios that would lead, lead, to, lead to different fluxes, a different ratio between intervortex distance and blah, 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 and also the initial scale. And what I'm showing here is the energy spectrum compensated by the Kolmogorov prediction as a function of k over k of the initial condition. So this is aimed to collapse the Kolmogorov region, and it does. So this is a plateau uh, with a constant. Actually, we measure the flux with a constant that is close to 1. Okay? So we do a bunch of simulation. We normalize it as a Kolmogorov prediction, and we get a good match around 1. We can do the same for the Kelvin wave. So you see, this is where we expect to have Kelvin waves. If we do the same, so we use now k over k associated to the intervortex existence to shift in the horizontal plane, and we divide uh, the kinetic inspector of over the whole prediction. And what you get for almost all the run, except for the standard GP, a kind of nice collapse okay, in this region, a plateau which is uh, decent enough. And uh, the, the, the more amazing thing that actually this plateau is very close to the theoretical prediction of the constant, given by the way turbulence theory, which is really um, uh, a surprise. So, um, so basically the, 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 the story of this part okay, is that the Kelvin wave exists, at least in the numerical simulation, it's there and it's really carrying energy okay, from the intervorsal distance to the smallest we can. Okay? We are in an experiment that we are probably very far from uh, studying such things, but uh, it, it, should be, it should be there, and uh, I hope when one day we could observe it. So now it br that brings me to the second part of the talk, but that is vortex reconnection. Okay? What I'm showing here is, uh, is three different movies. Okay? So probably you have, you have seen already the first one. It's from the experimental group of uh, William Irvine in Chicago, where they studied, this is water, okay? just water, and uh, they, they put a threefold knot, and they were studying some topological aspect of those reconnections and, uh, and see one. Many, many things. We already 
uh, we had some discussion about helicity and things. so it was a very kind of revolutionary type of experiment and that it was very nice. So you can do the same in average stocks. It's not very difficult to simulate a trifold knot. Dynamic is, is nice, it's very beautiful. You have bridges that uh, they are uh, previous to reconnection. But if you mind, if you want to describe that theoretically, it's, uh, it's kind of tough. What I'm showing here is uh, the humble gross pit model, where I have a, so this is the outcome of a tracking, okay? So it's a trifoil knot. And what you observe is uh, vorticity, so those filaments are much simpler. The colors correspond to the local curvature, and the arrows, the orientation of the vortex. So it's kind of way simpler, and uh, you really expect here to have a chance to say something theoretically, and uh, actually we can. So the first thing we can say or we can try to answer is what is the minimal distance between two vortices, or how they approach as a function of time. So the first thing that physics could, should do is a dimensional analysis. Okay? So if you are looking at distance, okay, we have two vortices okay, that are about to reconnect. So their distance is delta, and the delta is much larger than the core size. So you are not expected to be affected by what is uh, the small scale dynamic but obviously much smaller than the size of either the size of the box or the distance to the neighboring uh, pair of vortices, there is just one physical parameter which is important, that is the circulation of the vortex. So remind you, circulation has the dimension of L2 over T. If you want to construct a uh, length, there is, no many op there is no any other option that the distance should scale like T to the one half, okay? With some prefactor. So I will call minus respecting, what minus will be before reconnection and plus will be after reconnection. And you have two prefactor, plus and minus, that uh, will play an important role. On the other hand, okay, when we are very close to reconnect, okay, this is a, a very nice idea also from uh, Sergei Nazarenko and, uh, and West. You say, if okay, if now if delta is much smaller than the healing length, so they are really about to reconnect, but they haven't touch yet those lines, okay? Psi is close to zero at that point. So if I take my GP equation, I can neglect nonlinearity, okay? What we know, typically those vertices approach like an hyperbola, okay? So we can take, uh, so if we neglect this, we have just the linear Schrodinger equation that we all know how to solve. If we take an initial condition, like uh, right here, that correspond, if you like, find, you look for the zeros of this equation, it's just a degenerate hyperbola. Okay, so you have this asymptotic result at the reconnection time, and if you want to know what is psi at time t, you just multiply by the, the exponential of the Laplacian. And this can be performed analytically because this is just a polynomial. So you have an exact solution. And what I'm plotting here is, is the zeros of psi of x and t. Okay, what, I'm, what this idea supposes that the reconnection takes place on a plane. Okay, so basically you have a three-dimensional movement, but the time they reconnect, they are locally on a plane, okay, uh, approaching to an hyperbola. Under this assumption, okay, you have this very simple theory, okay? And if, um, sorry, I didn't say, but uh, wait. And if you do the analytical calculations, you also observe that the prediction for a small scale also goes like t to the one half. Again, you can guess it. You could have guessed it from dimensional analysis. So you have, at a scale much larger than the core, t to the one half, a scale much smaller than the core, t to the one half. It's kind of natural to, to expect that that goes all the way down. But there were there were many papers uh, in the, the, the sometimes in the in the um, in the 2010s that they were showing finding very different exponent. Okay, so we. Decided to, to, to analyze this, we had this uh, tool to track vortices, and we studied four case studies. So two perpendicular vortices, two antiparallel, a trifold noise, and also we took this tangle, and we look inside, and for instance here there is uh, two reconnections that are about to happen, okay? So we could track all those, uh, all those cases. And we look how they reconnect. And what we observe that the T to the one half scaling is, is really robust for all the cases we observe, we always follow the t to the one half. However, what you see, they are not each, the, the, so red is after reconnection, blue is before. You see they are not on top of each other, okay? So it means that the prefactors are different. So for instance, here this is not very different. Here there is a factor almost 10 between um, the red. So basically red is high, higher, it means that basically they approach with the same exponent, but they separate much faster, okay? So a way of represent, summarizing the result here is with uh, this plot, where we we plot a minus a function of a plus, and they are all light in this area, okay? 
So the A plus is almost always larger than A minus, meaning that in that sense, they are the forces separate faster than they approach, always following this t to the one half. Okay, and uh, the ratio of this parameter is very important. Actually, you can show from this very simple linear calculation that controls the ratio, controls the angle of approach of the two vortices. This is a very simple calculation, and so you see basically if this ratio is larger than one, which is the case of our data, it means that the, the post-reconnection angle should be smaller than pi over two. Okay, this is what is going on. But the theory is completely reversible, and uh, it can be that or can be that. I mean, there is no way of distinguishing between one or the other at, at this point of the linear theory. So what we did later is say, okay, let's do some, something more consistent. Okay, we took a, a, a half, half length, so it's a ring, uh, two rings that are linked, and we move the offset. Okay, we varied uh, a lot, over more 40 points here. So we study 40 reconnections, and we do the same thing. So what we see that this all pairs, all, all the recognition always take more or less the same. So first of all, if you plot delta square over time, it's linear and linear, okay, showing the, the scaling. No matter what was the initial condition, they approach more or less in the same manner. So this is very consistent with uh, what was shown yesterday, okay? But after reconnection, there is a spread of solution, okay? This is summarized in, in this plot, where I'm also plotting some uh, data provided by Luca from uh, reconnections in a trap uh, museum. We said they're all lying uh, really pretty much like here, okay? And uh, there are two facts that are important. First, that uh, it w has been predicted by in pure views of our calculation that the value of, of a minus should be around zero pr uh, 0 0.45, which is consistent with uh, the data. This was a pr pretty amazing uh, coincidence. But also nice that uh, John Hussein, they, they run navier stock simulation, that is just pure classical uh, uh, simulation, that they observe something very similar. Okay, so the same phenomenology was observed. They separate faster than they reconnect in, in terms of this prefactor. So what is going on? Okay, it's basically there is some irreversibility in the problem, which is related to sound emission. Okay, uh, so this is a similar. So this is a movie we, we made actually to explain, okay, what is going on. I don't know if how many with time, so maybe we should speed up. So what, but basically this is the initial condition that we are plotting. So this we have this two vortex ring, okay, that are there, and um, maybe we should speed up a bit this. I don't know how to speed up. Well, uh, well, I can. Uh, well, I can hear uh, blah blah blah. Uh, so uh, it's, this should be a way of controlling the film, but uh, no. So the idea, the idea is we have this uh, two vertex ring, okay? So what I'm plotting in blue here is the variation about the bulk density. So initially it's very uniform, okay? Remember the density goes to zero, so we, we see kind of this halo. This is normal from the initial condition. And um, the initial condition is prepared s with a minimization method, so there's really not energy. And this is the reconnection. And what you observe is really amazing pulse that is emitted at the reconnection. Okay? And uh, it's pretty clear, so the, there is a well-defined orientation of the pulse. Okay? And um, well, this is pulse of the sound of, of reconnecting vortices, as Mark announced. And uh, naturally, you expect this is the, the source of irreversibility in the problem. That perhaps it's a so very, uh, unlike yesterday, we were, um, we, were, we were hearing about Kelvin waves that were propagating, but that was like a large-scale effect. This is really the, the consequence of the reconnection itself. There are no times to see Kelvin waves in this pulse. Okay, so this is something we can measure with all our data. Okay, so basically this is the energy, okay? So the compressible part of the energy, so it's the waves that uh, goes through over time. So initially, it's almost constant. Here is a reconnection that's uh, indicated by this point. There is a jump of, uh, of the energy, so increase. 10 minutes, I'm, I'm fine. And what you see in the end, uh, there is some energy has been radiated, okay? So the energy was converted from vortices to sound, okay? So for all the simulation I had, I can measure this jump, okay? And report it in one of these points. So here, this is the energy of the pulse, what was emitted as a function of this parameter that I measure, A plus over A minus, okay? So obviously it has to be positive, okay? Because uh, there's energy that is radiated. radiated. Uh, we observe the data, they are always in the uh, A plus over A minus positive, is what we measure. The question is why we don't have points here, 
okay? And this is something that we can try to, to understand, okay? Uh, by some energy consideration, okay? The idea is, is the following. So thanks to the linear uh, Schrodinger equation, we know quite well how recognition takes place in a, in a superfluid. We, are, we have analytical predictions. We know that the vortices approach through Biot Savart low, okay? And, uh, and they go out through Biot Savart when they are a bit far apart. So the idea is the following. So I can, I can use kind of matching and mixing theories to compute and compare energy. So the idea is basically, okay, we repeat the calculation of, uh, of linear showing an equation, a bit generalized, so we allow this, the vortices to have torsions. It's not really planar, but it's with some uh, torsion. But the idea is the same. So if you plug these sounds, that which represent the reconnection at the, the wave function of reconnection time, you can get the parameterization as a function of s and time for the vortices before and after reconnection. So this is a kind of a straightforward calculation. When you have all the vortices, for instance, you can compute the distance, that scale like t to the one half, this we knew, and the ratio of this value, it depends on the two parameters of the model. Okay? But using this theory, we are not able to say if this should be smaller or larger than one. So we need to do something else as this is matching. So, as I say, vortices approach to reconnection, okay? So we can compute, for instance, the momentum of the vortices using, using the, the, the filament model, uh, what is now. For instance, momentum of the filament is just given by uh, this formula. Energy, at the simplest approximation, is related to the vortex length of the system. So we can compute this here. So we take this as an input, okay? So we have our vortex filament. Let's say we reconnect it with uh, Schrodinger equation, and we have the output. So Schrodinger a linear theory allows us to go through singularity and evaluate now momentum after reconnection and energy after. And when then we compare, okay, both. Well, it's so now that they are not equal, okay, so they are the different. There is a difference in momentum and a difference on, on energy. And uh, what's come out here is this. Basically, um, there is uh, so this is basically the end. The, what I'm plotting here in regions is what I, the, this uh, linear reconnection allows. So there's all not possible uh, values of the energies are allowed by the geometry of the reconnection. Okay? And if you want to have basically something that is uh, ovulating this in this point, you will need to provide energy to the system. Okay? So in other words, energy has to be, the, 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 there is a loss of energy in the reconnection. A loss of energy means a, a, a loss of vortex length. Okay? So uh, the, the vortex reconnection is, is, is in such a way that uh, the vortex approach, in order to geometrically reconnect it through, through the singularity, we need to cut a piece of vortex and dissipate it. Okay? And uh, this is just a geometrical consequence. It's, not a, it's, not, it's really given by the way that this person acts to reconnect these vortices. Okay? So the important fact is pure geometry says that I need to get rid of a piece of vortex in order to go through, this through, the, um, through the reconnection, and there is only one possibility, that is to have points in this area here. These are possible, uh, allowed by the theory, but you need to supply energy in order to get them. We can also get that uh, from the same for the momentum conservation that the pulse is well defined in one particular direction. Okay, so you have this plane and the pulse has to be emitted up upwards. That also comes from this very simple theory. Okay, so, so the takeaway message there is a, an irreversibility in, in the system. So, what is this? Uh, there is a time of error, as we were seeing yesterday, and it's really giving because there is they have to separate faster because it's the cheapest way for the vortex to do it. Okay, so now to I will just to make a small advertising. So we just uh, got a project, ANR project funded with uh, with Matteo Gibert, uh, Pierre Philippe Corte, and Juan Polanco. So it's uh, it has two components. So the, the most important one is the experiment that Matteo has uh, developed over the perhaps the last ten years. It's called CreoLM, where uh, the, he they he they have recently got a lot of success creating. So it's a cryostat that is uh, rotating. Okay, everything is super well controlled, and they also can have a counterflow. So what I'm showing here is uh, is a movie, okay, in real time where you see nicely the abricots of lattice, where they can repeat it as many times as, as they want. I won't take mad because Charles will probably talk about that uh, next week, okay. And uh, the second part is more theoretical and numerically. It's concerned the Foucault model, which is an average Stokes coupled with uh, vortex filament. We will actually we were we will communicate in uh, in both to to study. So you see, this is, there are not many options to simulate such, uh, 
such things. If you would like to do Grospitajewski, you will be really in trouble because you really need to account for, uh, for finite temperature effects. If you want to do HVBK, it's not possible neither because intervortex distance, you, you want to look at things that are smaller than that, so you cannot do HVBK. Um, you could say maybe vortex filaments alone will give something, but still the fluid, everything is rotating, so we really expect that normal fluid will interact and that the vortices will affect what's going on in the normal fluid and we need this feedback to, to describe. So the advertising is that uh, there is uh, one postdoc position available. So if you, you know, please spread the voice and um, if someone here is interested. No, no, it will be, it will be the, in, in, in my group. So it will be the, the theoretical numerical counterpart. Okay. And um, so just to summarize, so to make it short, so I talk about Kelvin way. So it's basically Kelvin way ca cascade exists at least theoretically. Whether we can observe it or not uh, was difficult numerically, probably experimentally, it's, a really, uh, it's really not possible today. And the second part was about vortex reconnection. So what I, just to end, uh, here I'm showing three kind of uh, snapshots of uh, superfluids, this is just what I show. Uh, classical fluids, so it's never stocks, and that's never stock with hyperviscous uh, term, okay? So what I said, in order to have a reconnection, geometrically, we need, get, we need to get rid of a piece of a vortex, okay? So this is what happened. The only way that uh, Grospedal have has to do it is just emitting a sound pulse. But if you do classical fluid, there is no sound, uh, there is no sound in incompressible nitrate stocks, but we have viscosity. And basically, what's going on is basically the same. So the reconnection, this, we need that geometrically in order to make it uh, happen, and dissipation actually will just delete this piece of the vortex. And if you do it with hyperviscous, it's even more um, more clear what is going on. So yet I could, I think I could end uh, with that, and I'm happy. Uh, thank you for your attention. Yes, thank you, um, Giorgio, for this wonderful talk. Uh, I'm not sure I have fully understood uh, this uh, energy emission because from the linear Schrodinger computation, it seems that A plus over A minus only depends on the initial torsion and curvature yes. uh, of the approaching vortices. So I don't know so what does it it's has to do with the energy emission. Or you mean that energy emitted is, is just... Uh, Governed by so what, uh, what it says, what uh, the Schrodinger, it's, it's, there is no choice. I mean, both are equally probable, okay? And indeed, depends on these parameters. And these parameters can be mapped, actually, to the angle, the asymptotics of, of the lines, okay? Mm -hmm. So in the end, you can forget about torsion, this parameter. If you see two lines that are approaching to each other, just draw two asymptotes, and this gives an angle, and this is the control parameter, okay? But everything is possible through the Schrodinger uh, limit. The question is, and then the system needs to choose something, okay? And then this we measure things not in the using kind of Biosavart approach of filaments to measure, okay, I know how to pass through singularity using Schrodinger, but I will measure with another tool before and after, and I see the energy difference. And when you do that, you select what is possible and what is not, okay? So in order, if you want to have this ratio smaller than one, you need to provide energy. You need to, instead of taking a piece of vortex away, you need to kind of take a vortex from somewhere from... In general, it does, uh, it, does not, uh, it does not go inside your band, it goes just on the line. <laughs> the what, sorry? The Here? No, so I didn't get... Uh, a minus is constant. A minus is constant, yes. So is no, add which, sorry, I'm uh, not really getting the question. Uh, that one. Is a no, um, now, why, why a minus, I, e, a minus is constant? This comes from Bios Avart calculation, okay? So it's a, it's a kind of very general result that was by uh, Bue, Itamar, and um, Dimitri Komenko, okay? So it's a, Kind of, you are invoking the self-similar evolution of Bios Avart and a universal attractor of this. Uh, it should be that, okay? Um, ah, the blue line is just a fit. Uh, it's not uh, more uh, profound than that. Uh, why it's not more spread? Uh, I don't know, okay? So uh, as a matter of fact, we don't really control, we don't know how to control the way they approach. 
okay? We, this is, we just put random, uh, random kind of, uh, we explored for this uh, half link a bit all the possibilities we had, but we don't control how they are connecting. Very nice talk, Giorgio. Thank you. Um, so you showed that both the approach and the uh, fall, falling apart the process uh, exhibit the two to the minus one half uh, yes. power law. Um, but this applies to a very short time around the reconnection moment. Not really. Right? I mean, no, uh, no, not really. So, it's a, so the linear theory, yes. So the linear theory really applies when they're yeah. about to reconnect. But then you have dimensional analysis or bio savart scaling that tells you that's that's go well beyond. Okay, the only way of not having this is that you have neighboring vortices, okay, or a wall, which uh, is equivalent to say neighboring vortices uh, through images, which is changing. So there is a paper by uh, by Newcastle Group mainly, Luca uh, Newcastle. Yeah, Newcastle, my, my yeah. question is uh, yes, experimentally actually we can observe this uh, t to the minus one half over very large time scale. Yes. But then the question is, do you think the prefactor remains the same for this very tiny region and the uh, later time region? Uh, I, I have, I, I have from the numerics of gross Pitayeski, yes. It seems that the, the same power law goes from... Um, I mean the prefactor. Yeah, 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 the prefactor. So you see from these numerics, uh, there is so... Basically here, the linear regime starts here, okay? And this here is really like bios of art vortices that are getting uh, close to, to, to each other. So this is kind of large scale, and uh, the, the you don't see a jump in the prefactor. Okay, I, it's hard to believe that you have two asymptotic regime with the same power law. Okay, and that you match them through something else that's different. It's, it could happen, but it's, uh, you really need something complex in order so to. This move. is uh, in the from the tangle. Uh, this is from a tangle, okay? Tangle, I have less, I cannot really go to for on a very large scale, so it's more or less, it's everything is in the linear regime. But if, uh, so this is for the trifold node, okay? So this is the linear regime. This is really like a because of our dynamics also here. This is at one, it relates, it's really when the linear regime start to being uh, valid, and this is more because of art, so you don't really observe, uh, it should be the same constant. Yeah, real, real interesting. Thanks. Thank you. Um, in this, you talked a lot about that intervortex uh, dis average distance as it's almost as if it's a fixed quantity. But if it arises from as a result of the ener the flux coming from the bigger scales, would you expect the signature of intermittency to to have kind of a spatially variable uh, intervortex distance caused by the intermittency at the larger scales from the from the regular fluid? I could be, yeah, yes, yeah, yeah. It's, um, yeah, the fact that this is just a very rough estimate, so that I don't even know if it makes sense in that sense to talk about a mean intervortex season when you have a lot of reconnections, a lot of mass. You see, the it's just to separate what is small scale and large scale, right. and I, I wouldn't put more emphasis on uh, fluctuation of this quantity. I think so. Okay, mm. thanks. So uh, at the time of reconnection, uh, I guess the curvature of the filaments is uh, infinite, right? Yes. So doesn't this imply some kind of singularity where some equations cease to be uh, satisfied in the classical sense, at least? So first of all, um, singularity is, is for the line, okay? So yeah. But however, remember what I'm doing here is gross Pitayeski which yeah. is a completely regular field. There is no singularities and uh, there are regularity yeah. proofs of that, okay? Yeah. So what's going on is really that you have dispersion, okay? And uh, this regularizes everything. So if you insist looking at the, fi at the, at the, at the filament of zeros, okay, okay, you have a singularity because if uh, kind of degenerates, uh, but it's not really a singularity. Everything okay, is so in, 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 in the uh, gross Pitayevsky world, it is the dispersion that kind of regularizes that. Yes, yeah. yes, and you have the, the, the interesting question is uh, what happens when dispersion goes to zero, okay? As will be the same in average stocks as, as uh, the viscosity goes to zero. And, uh, what does it emerge? So if um, uh, for people who are a bit familiar with uh, 
with more fundamental question of, uh, of turbulence, if you yeah. look at this thing, you have trajectories that go through semi-attractor yeah. and they yeah. spread like that, yeah. really makes appeal to some spontaneous yeah. stochasticity, yeah. Okay? where but you have a singularity that is, yeah. you have a small parameter that's yeah. regularizing things, and then you take this to, to zero, and then yeah. you have a uh, stochasticity after. But, but this is just a speculation, and it's, it has to But be. when you look at this through the lens of the local induction approximation, and you know we have the uh, binormal um, uh, yes. flow equation, then the right hand side is not satisfied at the at the time of reconnection, right? Because we cannot compute the we cannot compute the normal the tangent vector. But the the, the point is that the reconnection time you cannot even apply uh, of art. Yeah. You see. Because it's, uh, you're looking at scales that are smaller than the vortex core, and a view of art is really for scales that are much larger than the core. Mm. So, so it's right. so you need something to to connect in either in Lie or uh, vortex filament. So I have a last question, or one before last. Is <laughs> you said the irreversibility comes from the sound emission? Yes. So is, my question is really two questions. First, how does the system realize it must emit sound? I understand it cannot absorb, because to absorb it would need sound coming out. So it can only emit. So the question is, when does the system decide, hmm, I've got to emit sound? <coughs> and and uh, another, thing, another question is, could one devise a reversible reconnection? That it is it recon reconnections are common. One? So first, I can answer the second question. I have a mic. So it's the system is completely reversible. Okay. So if I if I if I take that movie that it show after the pulse is I mean uh, even after the pulse is everywhere in the box and I do time reversal, I will see the pulse coming into the reconnection sure. and uh, the that, that will work and uh, for those simulations, if uh, at least you are doing a pseudo spectral simulation. That's not my question. Ah, my so question is, can you engineer a reconnection that will not emit sound? So but it could happen in both directions. That's my question. Or do uh, all uh, naturally occurring reconnection emit sound? Well, it's, That's my question. it's kind of related to the... Okay, do you have any statistic of what is the amount of sound? Uh, what is the distribution, a PDF of sound emission by... No, we have 40 points. We have 40 points. So it's we have 40 reconnection, which is very nice. So but with 40, you don't make a PDF. This one is the this one. So this one is very reversible. It's close to one. One meaning no energy emission, but still emitting some of energy. This one here is is very bad. Okay. So the question is how I do reverse uh, from a how, how do trigger initial conditions in order to have the. Uh, what characterizes the one that emits a lot of sound? I I don't know. I don't know. So, but this we, we need to be a bit careful because when the, when the caps is produced, the caps is really at small scale, and uh, such small scale is not a fluid. Okay, what is going on? It's, it's really a dispersive system. So it's it's not like a, the acoustic emission of a vortex that is accelerating. Okay, it's, it's it's really different. So this was the first attempt we did. So we we took the standard formulas of uh, pressure of a vortex filament moving and say let's let's compute energy like that. It's, it's totally wrong. Okay, so it's it's really different. So at small scale, it's not a fluid. It's a dispersive. It's more like a burgers, if you want. Okay, uh, kind of uh, pressure less fluid, because there is no pressure at such small scale. So it's not radiation by acceleration. It's really by as a emission of a very uh, different pulse. I think we have to stop oh. because it's ten past. Thank you. Thank you. Again.